the one thing that I try to help moms understand is that wherever you are, it's a season. You know, I remember nursing thinking I was never going to be able to wear regular clothes again. I would never wear a normal bra again. I would never have a shirt that I didn't have to find a snap or something for. But just having someone to share with you, this is going, this is going to pass. This is a moment in your life. It's a moment in time. It may even be a very difficult moment, but it will not be the lasting or overriding moment in your life. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for tuning in. That voice you heard in the intro is Deborah Porter. I hope you could hear in her voice what I hear, the calm tone of a confident yet firm and seasoned mother, the type of woman that many of us could use in our motherhood journey, someone who's a little bit ahead of us. In the current age of child rearing, we are relying a lot on our peers, a lot on internet connections, and less on the women who came before us. Deborah is a motherhood coach, the mother of three grown children, and a former probation officer. Today, she and I are talking about the seasons of parenthood and the importance of mentorship. While it's wonderful to have a village of people who are going through the same journey with you at the same time, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. So expanding your community to those in different seasons of life can bring some amazing new perspectives. I'd like to thank PrepDish for sponsoring today's episode. Back to school time is one of the weeks of the year that tends to be really crazy. But I felt like I was on top of the world because I spent about an hour in the kitchen Sunday prepping all the food for the week. With PrepDish, I can do all of the prep in advance. So I love to do it on the weekend when my husband's there to help me. Time and time again, PrepDish has relieved so much of my mental load when it comes to feeding my family. So what is it? It's a meal planning service. Each week you get a PDF in your inbox with the meals for the week. It's three parts. One is a grocery list, the next is a prep day list, and the last is dish day. You order all your groceries or you go to the store and pick them up. You set aside some time to do the prep. And then finally, getting the meals on the table is simple and straightforward. If you want to try it out, go to prepdish.com forward slash families and you'll get two weeks free. That's preptish.com forward slash families. Without further ado, I hope you enjoy my chat with Deborah. Hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm great, Danae. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for joining me today. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm kind of known as the ultimate mom coach in my neck of the woods. And I have the opportunity to work with some really amazing mothers who are tired of this title of super mom and they're ready to ditch it without guilt to still show up as a great mom, but also as a woman, as a wife, as a friend, as a daughter, we wear so many hats. And so they're ready to stop retiring all of who they are for this title of super mom and just showing up fully. Um, I had the opportunity to speak on my local morning news show and do a few podcasts to kind of get the message out even beyond my immediate area. And I just love seeing the light bulb come on for all of them as they realize, oh, I I don't have to do that. I can actually say no. So it's good. I love it. Yeah. And how old are your kids? My kids are grown now. I've got a 31, almost 31 year old daughter who got married right before the pandemic hit. Uh, I have a 27-year-old son and a 24-year-old son who just finished his first year of law school. So I've got I've got all grown kids now, but it's it's a great transition. It's really great moving into that um, relationship with them as adults. You kind of hear stuff that you really screwed up when they were little. That <laughs> and, of course, and now now they've got a voice to explain it. Um, but yeah, but they're 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 cool humans to hang out with. 
Oh, I love that. So have you always felt like this role of mentor and coach for other moms has been a part of your journey? When did you start that? It really has. I can think back to when my oldest son was born and I could remember friends asking me, how'd you do that? Or where'd you figure that out? Or where'd you read that or get that from? And I think it comes from part of it is how I'm made, right? Part of it is just who I am. I'm a systems girl. And for me, there's got to be a way to get things done. It helps to make it repetitive. It helps when I need to hand it off to somebody else to do. And as a former probation and parole officer, there were all kinds of systems in place for how we had to get things done and who we had to submit things to and approaching the judge. So for me, it was just really natural to figure out how do I take what I was doing out there and make that work for myself here? And as a result of that, yeah, I've been probably mentoring and leading mom groups and doing that kind of thing for, gosh, probably 25 years. You know, I never really thought about this connection between probation and parole officer and mother, but there, there's an interesting piece that kind of comes to mind to me in that you're really trying to prepare these people to go out into the world and be independent and be successful independently. And it, it there is it just it's totally interconnected? I never thought about that, but... Bingo. You are so right. There is the negative side of it too. My husband's right. like, these poor kids, they're being raised by a probation and parole <laughs> officer. Like, oh my God. But you're absolutely right. It's this thing of you want to nurture, you want to provide support, you want to give resources, you want to make sure that they know, you know, what they need to know as they launch, because we want the launch to be successful. We don't just want them to leave. We want them to leave ready and prepared and aware. And and knowing that you know, it's not going to be perfect. And as amazing as you are, you're not perfect either. And that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And I think our own imperfections are actually a way to make space for our kids to feel free to be imperfectly human as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I've, I've been thinking a lot over the past couple of years in the pandemic of these moms who became mothers during this time that they really didn't have that community or that opportunity to build this real life in person community. And I've felt worried for them. What are your thoughts about these, these women and the men too, actually? I I agree with you. Um, Some of my first thoughts when the shutdown happened were for moms, moms of young children, pregnant moms that were about to give birth. And I think that, um, this feeling of isolation is even more magnified for them because you remember having kids and having your mom come help, your sister, a neighbor, bring a meal. There were all of these touch points for us that mothers in the middle of the shutdown and the pandemic, they didn't get those touches. Or at least if they did, they were probably on a much smaller scale. And so what we're trying to figure out now is how do we now begin to help them create what is a healthy village, a healthy community? Because for two years, they've been kind of doing it by themselves. Yeah. With so much fear too. So much fear. The the things that we take for granted, right? Just being able to go out to go to Target, right? That has brought life to many of us in those early days. And that wasn't even a possibility. I mean, just on, right. on, on story a time, level. you know, yeah. my kids, Loved going to the library or the local bookstore where they were doing story time. I mean, it was just these little moments that were mostly unscheduled, but something to look forward to. And without that, um, you know, my concern really becomes for the mental health of this woman, Mm -hmm. that she just doesn't have this other outlet to allow her child or even herself to interact with another young mother. It's very challenging. I can, I can only imagine. Yeah. And what is comfortable for you might not be comfortable for another, um, especially I think these these women who were raising these newborns and, and young toddlers during the pandemic um, with unvaccinated kids were very obviously feeling very nervous for themselves, for their families. And um, finding other women who sort of operated in the same way as you to make friends with and to share that experience with. I imagine it's hard enough to begin with and you add on this extra layer and it just, 
feels very daunting. Absolutely. You know, for most of us, we don't live, well, maybe not most, but many of us do not live near our families. Like when I was growing up, I could walk to my grandmother's house. Uh, my uncle lived 15 minutes away. So there was this built in village where at a moment's notice, anyone could show up at our house and help my mother. My mother was a single mom of two, but you add that on as well, you know, to the young moms who don't live near their immediate family. Uh, who, who are they calling in those moments when they just think, I can't get the baby to stop crying? Or who are they calling when they're trying to work and they've got a baby? You know, who who's the one that's able to support them in that moment? Uh, it's been daunting for, for many. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do think a silver lining, though, is that partners have been more present than ever when in working from home. I know I've seen that shift in my house that my husband has been there showing up more and that dynamic has shifted maybe for good that he's picking up more of the load than ever before. I had always worked from home and he had always worked out of the home and I always naturally found more falling on my shoulders. Um, so I, I, I almost wonder if finding that balance at home with everyone being home, maybe has come a little more naturally. What do you think? I would like to hope so. Um, And I think that's fantastic that that's how the dynamic worked out in your home. I think the other thing, though, is that we are creatures of habit. And even in the middle of a pandemic, we're still creatures of habit. And so I've been working a lot trying to help mothers and encouraging them to find the way to ask for help. Many of us wear this title of super mom and Mm -hmm. we almost feel like we're supposed to do it all. It's my responsibility to do it all. And so backing out of that, realizing that super mom was derived from Superman, which is a costume, it's not even a real person, but we've adopted this identity and we're trying to live it out. And it's really impossible. And uh, the default parent, um, tends to be in heterosexual relationships, the woman, it tends to be the mom. And so really being able to step into, um, being able to say, you know what, I need support around this. Um, I'm unable to do the laundry. I think that's now your responsibility. I'm not cooking seven nights a week. So it's finding your voice and not expecting that our mates can read our minds. I think a lot of women think mm. he should know. He should yeah. realize I'm doing everything. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work <laughs> right. like that. It just doesn't. We've got to be able to speak what it is that we need in very clear and uncertain terms. Um, and I, you know, I would tell women, don't ask, right? You don't have to ask your spouse, can you watch the kid? It's his kid too look, I'm going to run out. I've got a day of stuff planned. I'll see you guys when I get back. I'll be gone a few hours. But really just stepping into it and standing in it. Um, And I find that when we do that, most times they're willing. They just don't always kind of see it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think often we struggle to vocalize what we need because we aren't even sure. It's all just kind of mushed together in our brains and we're used to doing everything. And it's hard to separate the things that we can pass on and the things that we ourselves need to do. And then it kind of becomes, we need to be the ones doing all the things in order to get all the things done in the way that we want them done. So bingo, you hit it on the head because we want it done a certain way. I remember the first time I turned over our linen closet to my kids I just thought, I'm not fiddling with this anymore. Like they know how to fold towels and sheets. And I remember looking at it after they had been doing it for a while. And I mean, it was, and I had this instinct to straighten it up, but I was like, you know what? I'm not doing it because I've given it to them. And so we have this way of delegating, but then if it's not done to our standard, we go back and we redo it. And they see us do that. And so at that point, why do they want to do it? Because they know you're just going to redo it because it has to be done correctly or it has to be done right. And I think what we've got to realize is when we delegate something, it's no longer ours, right? There are two things. There are things that I have to do and there are things that have to get done, but really they can be done by anyone. 
we've got to get really clear on what those two things are. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned folding because I fold everything and I put it in my closet. Like as far as my stuff, I fold it and I put it in my closet and it never stays folded because the minute I go looking for something, I tear through there and everything gets unfolded. So, but yet I continue to fold things. And I often wonder to myself, you know, what is the point if you are just going to tear through and unfold everything? And my daughter is the same way, right? She just, like you give her five minutes in a freshly folded set of clothes and in a set of drawers and she just tears through it looking for something and it's all a mess. And I wonder, she's only six right now and I still fold her clothes, but I just, I wonder, I'm like, do I even like, do we even ask her to fold? Is there even any value in that? Or do I just, you know, <laughs> let, let it be? <laughs> you you got to pick your battles. And that's right. a really common saying. But as a mother, this is more true now than ever. Um, I was a real stickler for order in my home. I needed things to be in order. I needed rooms to be neat. I needed. And as I look back on it, those were not battles I should have been picking. There were more important things going on with my tweens and teens at that moment than is your bed made. So, you know, take it from a mom that's kind of on the other side of it. Just close the door. Like if you don't like what their room looks like or give them a day that, okay, on Saturday before you head out with your friends, just tidy up your room. But we get so hooked on these little things that we sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture. So just step back a minute and really assess, is this the hill I want to die on today? Is this the argument I really want to begin and to have with my child? Or do I really need to connect with them because I think something else might be going on with them? Yeah. And and my daughter does really struggle with a messy room as I did as a kid. My whole, I still struggle with a messy room at times. And I, I always offer to help. Let's do it together yeah. because I think there is value in her feeling what it, how good it feels to have a clean room and that experience of being in a tidied up space. It doesn't last, but she knows how good it feels. So there's that inspiration to to set to reset and to tidy it up. But she does need some support and a helping hand. But I think that's beautiful, Danae, because what you're doing is you're doing it with her. So not only are you having some time together and there's a connection there, but you're also beginning this process of delegating, right? Many times we'll say, well, I asked them to do it. Yeah, but did you show them how to do it? Did they understand what you needed them to do? When you say clean the kitchen, did they know that means also wipe down the counter and sweep the floor? So you're giving her so much in that time. You're, you're actually showing her how to do it. And there's a connection there. So that is the proper way to do it. In my opinion, that is the way that you get longer lasting results when it's something you're doing together and actually showing them the process, as opposed to just saying, go clean your room. Right. Because then I feel like it does become somewhat of a power struggle if you're just telling them to do it and they have to do it every day and it becomes a battle of wills and um, your need to control all things within your home really sort of sets the tone, which is always a kind of a lose-lose situation. It is. It is because they are instantly going to push back whenever it's communicated that way. It's just, it's almost human instinct that I want my own opportunity. I want my own space. I want to make my own decision. So yeah, I love, I love that you're doing it that way. That's awesome. I am excited and grateful to welcome two new sponsors to the podcast this week. The sponsors help to keep this show in business. So I appreciate your support. The first sponsor is Lus Brands. If you followed me on Instagram, you know that for several years, I've been trying to work some kind of miracle with my slightly wavy, mostly messy looking hair, which is why I'm excited about Lus Brands. They have a simple three-step system, shampoo, conditioner, and an all-in-one styler. What I love is that all-in-one styler doesn't make my hair look wet, it's not too heavy, leaves me with a little bit of shine and some much improved waves. Additionally, Lus Brands are free from harsh ingredients and they're dermatologist tested and approved. Right now, my listeners can get 15% off your first purchase of $50 or more, but only when you go to lusbrands.com and enter the promo code SIMPLE. That's L-U-S brands with an S dot com promo code SIMPLE. 
Get 15% off with promo code SIMPLE at lessbrands.com. The second and final sponsor is Little Spoon. Somehow summer is already ending and that means the busier season, back to school, regular life is coming our way. And one way you can make your life easier is Little Spoon. Little Spoon is a one-stop shop for healthy, easy mealtime and snack time for your baby, toddler, and big kid delivered right to your door. They offer fresh, organic baby food for every stage. They have toddler and kids meals that even picky eaters will love. Little Spoon makes everything fresh and uses absolutely nothing artificial. You can pop your meals in the fridge or in the freezer and use them when you're ready. And while they are made for kids, I definitely have found my very much grown up partner snacking on them too. So take advantage of this time-saving, delicious, healthy option that you can feel good about for your kids. Enter the code SIMPLE50 at checkout to get 50% off your first Little Spoon order. That's 50% off your first Little Spoon order with the code SIMPLE50 at checkout. Thanks so much for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Deborah. My eight-year-old, actually, he's been... um, exercising his opinions lately in the form of body autonomy for everything. So he's been saying my body, my rules. If I want to stay up late, past bedtime, watching TV, my body, my rules. And I'm like, "Eh, it doesn't really work like that. (laughs) Not quite. You're almost there, but not quite. (laughs) My body, I can sit it on the sofa as long as I want to. It's, um, but it, it, it actually, it does kind of bring up things for me. I'm kind of like, well, like it is your body and it is your rules and you are in control of how you spend your time, but I'm still steering the ship. Yep. Yep. And there are still things that have to get done and that's what they don't Mm get, right? There are things that you must do in order to then get to the moments and the places of the things that you want to do. Um, and that's, that doesn't change, right? We don't always, when we get up every day, want to be super productive and dive right into work. It's, it's a life skill and it's a discipline and, yeah, they don't get that. That's why they have us. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually remember as a child when we had to do chores and we, we had to do a very basic amount of chores, probably similar to what most did. It wasn't anything excessive. Um, like on Saturdays I'd have to vacuum the living room or something like that. And I remember really, really feeling honestly that I did everything in my house when I vacuumed the floor. <laughs> I would say to my mom, I'm like, well, we do everything around here. And now I have that coming at me. My kids, whenever they do something like that, whenever they do a chore, they will say to me, you know, we do all the work around here. What do you do? That kind of attitude. And it's so, it's fascinating because I really believed that as a kid, like when I did something that I was doing everything and I did not see all of the labor that went into parenting that my parents did. Yeah, you can't see it from a kid's perspective. For kids, the world kind of does revolve around them. Mm-hmm. Um, they are, you know, for many years, they're kind of the center where, you know, their practice, their soccer game, their, you know, their thing. So there is this sense of, you know, they're in the center of it all. But um, I, I happen to believe that kids that learn to do chores are responsible they are kind, they are willing to pitch in and help. I just think it's, it's not even like a punishment. It's, we all live here together. So we all have a piece of this puzzle called our home that we can chip in and we can add to, and we can do, you know, some people, some parents will pay their kids to do chores. We did not pay for chores. We paid for grades, right? Because that's something you're actually having to do. That's, there's a lot of autonomy around how hard you work in school and what you do um, when it comes to your education. But yeah, I just, I think that chores really are a no brainer. Um, There's no reason why one person, AKA mom should be responsible for all the things. It's, it's just, it's not a good lesson to teach. I remember when my daughter went for to college And she calls me, she says, mom, there's a girl here that doesn't know how to work the washer machine. I was like, are you kidding me? And she was like, no, like she's never had to wash her own clothes ever. And she's 18. And I just thought, whew, I'm glad I got that out the way early. Like (laughs) it's, 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 it's necessary. Yeah. Well, and I think the only reason that we don't have kids do chores is that just, it's hard to execute. Like sometimes it's easier just to do the laundry ourselves rather than to ask a thousand times and remind and, and all the things. So 
I think we all would welcome chores, but sometimes it's the actual act of making it happen consistently, which feels yeah. like the battle. It ain't easy. Um, that's for sure. Um, but what part of raising kids is easy? Yeah. Right. There's, there's none of it that is a breeze and that we're just kind of sailing through without any headache. It's just, it's part of the package. It's part of what we have to pass on to them. There is this level and this sense of, um, having to know how to care for yourself when you're not here, you know? And so my son said, you know, he's like, well, I could just order Uber Eats. I don't need to know how to cook. And I'm like, yeah, you don't have a job yet, son. That's <laughs> not going to work. because I'm not paying for your Uber Eats five nights for a week. Real. <laughs> um, so, you know, they have these conveniences mm-hmm. that we didn't have growing up, right? You've got these apps where you can call and somebody will come hang your picture. Like there's just all these conveniences, but it costs money. So um, I'm, I'm just a firm believer in all the things we're teaching them, how to drive, you know, they need to know how to balance their account. You know, we're not using checks that much anymore, but you do have an account. You need to know what's going out and what's coming in. You do need to know how to cook a basic meal. You do need to know how to separate your lights from your darks. Like there are just these basic things that in the teaching of all the things we really can't neglect. Yeah, you're right. And budgeting and money is so important because I think in a lot of families, we don't talk about money and we don't talk about how we spend and we make decisions. I mean, I know I'm used to going to the store and I'll, you know, I'll be buying peanut butter and there's 15 different kinds and there's two that are on sale and one that's organic and one that's creamy and one that's crunchy. (laughs) And it's this huge decision-making process, right? But I'm not talking about it. So how in the world are my kids going to learn how to get the best deal on the best peanut butter. Right? It seems Absolutely. so silly, but but they I think when we can bring them in and we talk about it, we don't have to we don't have to, you know, give them as many possibilities. We can narrow it down for them, but explaining, you know, how do you look at the prices? How do you make a choice based on price and on your budget? Um because when we do it all and we do it all in our heads, we're doing them a disservice. Yeah. But, but, you know, you said something earlier that makes so much sense in the seat of mom. It's that, but it's just faster if I can just do it. Mm -hmm. Like, I just want to go to the grocery store and get what I need and leave. I don't want to have to explain to them, okay, this is our budget. So how much was that jar of peanut butter? Was that the best deal? Like, I don't have the energy. I don't have the time for all of that. And it's not something that we have to do every single time. But there are moments that you want to be able to sprinkle that lesson in there so that there's some understanding that I'm really not going in the backyard picking this money off the trees. Like, I'm really not doing that. Like, we really do have, you know, money that we have to be responsible and steward over um, because, you know, there's still a lot of life left to live. You know, many parents still have college to consider for their children um, and how that's going to look. So, it's just, it's, it's one of those important things that we got to sprinkle where we can. Yeah. I like that idea of sprinkling it where you can, because you're right. Mm-hmm. It is a lot, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort and we are, we're all tired already. <laughs> so yes. it shouldn't be Very. one more thing to add to our list, but we can sprinkle right. it in when possible. I like that. Right. And that's one of the great things to also delegate, right? So mm-hmm. um, those are the moments that, you know, you think about, okay, there are two sets of things that have to be done things that I have to do and other things that have to get done, but can be done by anybody. I remember there was a time where I delegated to my husband, all of the permission slips, things that have to be signed. Like I, this paper is overtaking our house when they get home from school and I just can't anymore. Um, Mm -hmm. So you think about these things. Yeah, that has to be done, but am I, do I have to do that too? Well, probably not. So if you divide those things up, it makes it a little bit easier to then pass it on and delegate it. Now, was my husband perfect at it? Nope. Were there times that my kids got to school and there was a trip that morning and they didn't have their permission slip? Yep. But guess what? That's still his to deal with. You were in charge of the permission slips, dude. You got to figure that out. I don't know if you're going to email him out a signature. I don't know what you're doing, but that's still your thing to figure out. Um, And then the other thing that does is a lot lets people know that you know, you've got a, pl- a place here too. Like I cannot do all the things and I'm not even interested in doing all the things. Yeah. Often I think we're afraid to delegate because it's not going to be done correct or done well, kind of like those permission forms. But the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, we drop the ball a lot of times too. So <laughs> I don't know about you, but I forget the permission slips plenty. 
So giving our partners or the people that we're delegating to the room to make mistakes the same way that we need to give ourselves that space. Yeah. And we're hard on ourselves, but you're right. We do make mistakes. I remember the time I actually forgot a kid and not even my kid. Like it was carpool. It was my turn to pick up this little girl. I completely forgot because I had 500 other things on my list and we're halfway home and she calls me and I'm just thinking she's calling to talk to my daughter. And I'm like, Hey, sweetie. And then I was like, I left you at school. Oh my God. (laughs) Turned around and grabbed her real quick. But then I knew I've got to call her mother because she's going to tell her mom, guess what? Miss Porter forgot to pick me up today. And thankfully she was super gracious. I mean, she was there with the teacher. She wasn't alone, but I felt horrible. But it was, that was one of those moments for me where I just had to say, okay, something's got to change. Yeah. Like that was a priority. And I've dropped that because I've got this list of all these other things running in my head. So, yeah. you know, we, we've got to stop making everything the priority, right? We've got this list of priorities. We've got 10 things that priority, it means the thing. It, we've yeah. pluralized the thing. And now we've got a list of priorities. No, there's one thing today. If nothing else gets done, this is this thing has to get done today. And be okay that the rest of that list can fold into the rest of the week. Yeah. You know, if I was the mom on the other other side of that um, situation of that little girl that you forgot, I probably would have felt relief. Like, wow, Deborah makes mistakes too. It's I'm not alone. That could have happened to me. And I don't know if everyone feels like that, but I, I it's not that I delight in other people's mistakes, but it makes it makes me feel like I'm not the only one. Yeah, we were, I mean, that moment. So up until that point, our daughters were friends. We weren't real. I mean, we were, you know, fine, but we weren't really friends. After that moment, we became friends. It was just like this, this thing of, oh my gosh, you're not perfect either. I think you're my person. Like it just, (laughs) it, it created, you know, an opportunity for us to be able to then kind of open up maybe in some other areas we were struggling in too, right? It just gave us this place to be open and honest. And for a moment, she was part of my village and I was part of hers. If I needed a break or if I needed um, a moment or if I needed, you know, my preteen to just kind of not be in my house at the moment because we were just bumping heads, I could quickly call her and go, hey, what's your daughter doing? Does she want some company? And she was like, yes, please, because she's going to drive me nuts today. (laughs) Um, So it allowed us to create um, a bit of a village that wasn't maybe the same village my mother had or the way my mother created her village, but it worked for us. Yeah. And friendships can really be born through vulnerability like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, you know, connection can come in different ways. We just have to be open to it. I just, you know, I love social media and it's great, but I think it gives us a false sense of connection you know, I'm in a couple of Facebook groups for moms. I'm doing stuff online. I get it. But there is this, um, I can be whoever I want online and in this group, right? I can show up however I want because it's it's random. But when you're in a relationship with someone or when you allow someone into your life and into your space, you can't keep that charade up for long. Uh, and I just think that it's so important, especially now, especially because we're doing so much online. There have to be some people in your life, in your circle, and in your village that really know you. And that takes vulnerability. And that's not, that's, it's not my favorite word, but it's, it's something that we've got to learn how to grow in and who and where to trust in. Yeah. How have friendships changed for you as you've grown into your role as a mother and moved through different stages? Initially, when I first became a mom, most of my friends were still working. I chose to come home after my second child was born. We had two under school age and childcare was just astronomical. It would have been a little bit more than half of my salary. It just didn't make sense. And so initially it was quite lonely. Um, I, I didn't know a lot of other stay at home moms. I had always considered myself and seen myself as a career woman. And I had this path I was on. Um, but what I found was um, there, there's no one way to have to build a village, right? This, I did not have to expect that this one person was going to be my friend for everything and in every area. Like I had 
buddies and we would shop together. I had other friends that were, you know, a more serious connection in, in other areas. So I think allowing our friendships to be what they are without the expectation that you have to be everything. You have to be my friend for everything in every way. And whenever I need something, you're I'm gonna call you. You're the one. That doesn't that that's a lot to put on anybody. So um, what I began to do was learn to grow and know that my friends didn't have to think like me, look like me, live where I live. It was important to have a diverse group of women in my life, older women, younger women. Um, some of my dear friends were women that were 10 or 15 years older than me because I needed them. I was a new mom. I needed that voice. I needed to call someone and go, okay, he's climbing on everything. Like, what do I, what am I, what am I doing? What, what happens now? Um, so I think being open to the fact that your friends don't have to be and shouldn't be carbon copies of you. Welcome difference into your circle and into your village and it will expand. Yeah. I think about the role of mentorship in motherhood. And a lot of times we're hesitant to consider ourselves mentors to women who are parenting younger children, because that sort of implies that mentors must be experts and must know everything. But that's not true, right? That's not true. I think a good mentor is just someone who's a little bit ahead of you. And they're willing to open up to you not only about their successes, but the mistakes that they've made. Because the idea is, I don't want you to make my mistake. I don't want you to have to recreate the wheel. And so many of us shy away from that title because they do feel like it should include some level of perfection or some level of mastery. And I think if I'm further along with you, I, you know, if I've got a kid that's 10 and you've got a kid that's five, I've mastered raising a five-year-old, like he's still alive. You know, he's potty trained and <laughs> what do we consider mastered? <laughs> exactly. So it's not an idea of I've been I'm I was perfect at it, but it's more I'm a little bit beyond you and I'm willing to share with you my story on how I did that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I'm willing to share my story because that story is very unlikely to be perfect. And I think that that maybe that's really the beauty of a mentorship relationship is that you see that those who came before you who have been through it, they messed it up a lot of the time too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, I, the one thing that I try to help moms understand is that wherever you are, it's a season. You know, I remember nursing thinking I was never going to be able to wear regular clothes again. I would never wear a normal bra again. I would never have a shirt that I didn't have to find a snap or something for. But just having someone to share with you, this is going, this is going to pass. This is a moment in your life. It's a moment in time. It may even be a very difficult moment, but it will not be the lasting or overriding moment in your life. So how do we put some things in place to get you through it? Because you can't go around it. You're going to have to get through it. But it's a moment. It's not forever. Yeah. What do you think about the importance of women wearing other hats other than just the mother hat, especially if they're a stay-at-home mother where their life is really in the home? You know, I think it is crucial that you don't surrender all of who you are to the title of mother. Now, some people are going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she said that. But follow me for a moment. Um, we've adopted this thing of super mom in a way that is burdensome and in my opinion has been damaging to women because it comes from Superman, which we know is a costume. It's not even a real thing, but we've adopted this thing of super mom in an attempt to put forth this um, facade that we're perfect. But what happens then when that kid leaves home? If, if mother is your only thing, if you've surrendered all of your ha hobbies, habits, interests, friendships, relationship, marriage, if you've surrendered all of that to just being mom, what happens when that child then leaves? Now, you're, it's not that you're no longer a mom, but you're not needed in the same way right? I have adult kids now. I can't parent them like I parented a 15-year-old. They don't need me in that way. But what was important for me along that journey was to maintain my relationships with my girlfriends. 
was still taking girls trips was my husband and I leaving them with the grandpa and grandma. I mean, like seeing a week, right. It was important that who I was as a woman did not get lost or um, vanish under this amazing role of mom. Um, it's an, it's amazing, but it's, it's not everything. And I'm concerned that, you know, I hear people say, oh, you're such a super mom. And I just cringe every time I hear someone compliment someone with that, because I don't think it's a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is a heavy burden to bear. And I, I feel mm-hmm. the same about the the term rock star. When someone says that to a mom, you're such a mm-hmm. rock star. And then, mm-hmm. you know, there's this idea that what happens to rock stars, they burn out. And right. that, that I think is a reality for many of us who try to do all the things and be all the things. It burnout is waiting for you. If that's you, burnout is waiting for you. And so the moms that I work with, I push each of them within the first quarter of us working together. One of the goals is that you take a two to three day trip by yourself. No husband, no kids. And many of many times we have to build up there. Many times we, there, are, there are moms who have never even gone out and had a meal by themselves, right? They're not used to their own company and sitting in the quiet of what it feels like at a dinner table for one, right? So spending and finding these moments and these times by yourself, it helps to give you a moment to think. It's hard to think in the chaos of everything that's going on Mm -hmm. in a home. It's just difficult to have a moment to really think about what are my dreams? What do I still want to do? What about that time I said I wanted to get into photography and I haven't picked up my camera in years? So pulling away for a couple of days just allows you to remember that person, that girl, that woman, and you've got to stay connected to her. And one of the best ways to do that for a mom is to kind of take you up out of that atmosphere and that home to get some time away, which is why you need some real systems in place. Because if you do that without systems, I don't, you could come back to anything. Like, I don't know, you could, it could, it, it could be anything. So it's important to have a few basic systems in place where other people know how things function and what to get done and how to do it. So that when you come back, it's not like now there's two weeks worth of work waiting for you and you are only gone three days. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. The accumulation of laundry and frozen pizza boxes. Yeah. I know this yep. <laughs> dish, dish, you know, sink full of dishes. Like, yeah, just having those things in place first really does allow you to leave. And here's the other thing. It was very important for me, for my kids to know dad can do everything mom can do. You don't, it doesn't, you don't have to run to me in the restroom and run past your dad. Who's like watching the game. Like you can, he can do everything I can do. And one great way to teach your family that is to not be there. Mm, That's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But so true. So true. I had a work trip with a pandemic. I haven't really left in a long time, but I had a work trip a couple months ago and it was supposed to be two days. And then I got snowed in, in Ohio and ended up being there five and, um, they, they were fine. They made it work. And you know, it, I think that you're right. I think the systems help, the routines mm-hmm. help. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times we say like, oh, kids really need structure. They really need routines. But sometimes I think that we need it just as much as they do. Mm-hmm. You know, I was probably a little bit more on the rigid side of the routines. But, you know, as I look back, you know, I I wish that there were moments that I had adopted you know, a lazy week during the summer or a lazy summer. You know, I think we had moments where, you know, it was like, whatever, you can be in your pajamas all day. But, you know, kids are under a lot of pressure right now, too. You know, we did not have the grueling, constant likes or no likes or who saw my picture, or who commented, who sent me a smiley face, who sent me a thumbs down. Like, they are under a lot of pressure, too. So think about, this summer, finding a pocket of time, a moment of time, you know, I I say, you know, let your kids experience what summer's like, we're like for you, make them just go outside and play. Like, remember that when you were just like sent out, just go play. It's like, okay, I guess I'll just chase the wind here. I don't know. Um, It's 
It's hard to do because we worry mm-hmm. about getting arrested for, mm-hmm. <laughs> for letting our kids be unsupervised. Uh-huh. I actually, uh-huh. um, my daughter has a little friend that lives around the corner and we let the girls, her mom and I let the girls go back and forth to each other's houses together by, the, by themselves. They'll walk together by themselves and they think it's the greatest thing ever to be independent and out of sight from us. Um, and actually a mom on the street saw them and stopped them recently. And I was outside and she just was like smiling and so happy. And I was like, oh, I saw her from a distance. Like, Is everything okay? And she's like, yeah, it's just so great to see kids out like this. It's like old times. That's what she said. And she was walking with her teenager. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess it's sort of this lost art of letting kids be alone outdoors. It's, yeah. it's not as hard. It's not as easy to do anymore. It's not. And there are, you know, there, there are some bad people out there. It's scary, but if you know, you've sent them and she's waiting mm-hmm. to receive them, you know, it's, it's unlikely that just in that short window, something really horrible will happen. And I think what it also communicates to our kids is I trust you. Yeah. Absolutely. I trust you. And, and we don't really say that out of our mouth a lot to our kids, but anywhere you can find an opportunity to allow them to feel and experience your trust, it really does go a long way in the connection that your kid has with you. And opposed from them, you know, opposed to running from you when something horrible happens, if they know there's trust there, they'll run to you and not from you. Right which is especially valuable in those tween and teen years. Which is what we want. You know, it's the thing that we want. But, um, you know, I think a lot of times we think their friends' voices are the loudest, but I think studies have shown that your kid's inner voice is you. So we've got to watch what we're saying and how we're talking to them because in their head, it's us they hear, not their friends. Mm Mm-hmm, 100%. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. Where can we find you online and more and learn more about your work? So my website, DebraPorter.net. I've got some free mom resources over there, some videos over there. And then on social media, I am at mom coach Deborah on IG. And uh, I'd love to be able to support anyone with some just a, sometimes just a few free articles or blogs or something can kind of shift how we're thinking about something. So if you head over to the website, you'll find some free stuff over there. Great. I'll put those in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed my chat with Deborah. If you want to get in touch with her or get the links to the things that we talked about, go to simplefamilies.com forward slash episode 321. When you have a minute, leave a rating or review for this podcast. That helps this show to reach more people. I appreciate you and I'm glad you're here.